So, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Alan Mulvihill. I'm one of the paediatric ophthalmologists in Edinburgh. And this is a variation on the talk that was put together by Freddie Burgess, who's one of our senior trainees, who's also becoming a paediatric ophthalmologist. And it's basically entitled, which neuroscience do I need to be worried about? And when I say neuroscience, it's really what, what you need to be worried about that are, you know, when, you, when you're thinking, does this child or adult for that matter, have a brain tumor? So what we're going to do first is we're going to put up a three questions, multiple choice questions, see what answers you give. I won't take them any further then, but it's just to get your thought processes going and to have a think about what sort of you want to get out of the talk and you know what, what the emphasis is on. Um, so Louise, if you can show the first question. So it's, what headache feature is most suggestive of raised intracranial pressure? In other words, high pressure inside the head, and you're worried about um, a brain tumor. So some clear favorite, well, there's one clear favorite. So most are opting for morning headache for a week. Uh, the next oh, that's seventy six percent, and the next is pre existing headaches that have been worse for the past month. Okay. So yeah, again, once again, the the question is: What headache feature is most suggestive of raised intracranial pressure? So one is morning headache for a week. Two is headache relieved by sleep. Three is pre existing headaches that have been worse in the past month. And the fourth is headaches while at school. Um, Louise, um, can you show the second question? Thank you. Let's see if I can bring it up. Okay. So the second one is, which of the following is most concerning? Firstly, crowded optic discs in a, in a myop. Second, Increased blurring of the nasal di disc margins over several years. Early crowded optic discs in a hyperope. Or fourth, absent spontaneous venous pulsation on the optic disc. Okay. Can everybody see that, hopefully? So... Which is the most concerning? Um, I'm not seeing answers there. Maybe I've pre pressed something, Louise. Um, so, which of the following is most concerning? Cr crowded optic disc in myo. Uh, crowd, uh, increased blurring of the nasal disc margins over several, progressing over several years. Crowded optic disc in a hyperope and absent spontaneous venous pulsation. Yes, so the most popular answer is a crowded optic disc in a myo. Okay. Um, right. Uh, and Louise, can you th please show the third question? So the third one is, which of the following is most concerning? Gradually increasing esotropia over a period of six months, sudden onset esotropia, large but stable esotropia, in other words, internal squint, or increasing esotropia over one month. So an interning squint that's been getting gradually worse over six months, sudden onset squint, large but stable squint and a squint that's been increasing over one month. It seems to be strong preference for the sudden onset squint as being the one that's of most concern. Okay, so bearing those in mind, I think we'll move on to the actual presentation. 
Um, so Louise, are, are you able to take that down or do I need to take it down, take down the, the poll? That should be it down now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk a bit about a thing called HeadSmart, which is a UK wide program to educate healthcare workers, both doctors, pediatric nurses, emergency room doctors, etc., cetera, um, and optometrists about the, the symptoms and signs to be aware of that would make you concerned that a child has a brain tumor. And I've got some uh, illustrative cases. Um, HeadSmart have a, say, or have a sort of a, a motto of better safe than Schumer. And they have a website called HeadSmart. So there's some useful stuff on HeadSmart and you know useful videos and um, it's it's you know it's pretty easy to follow and understand and it's yeah, yeah. it's very helpful. So this is a pretty busy slide, but um, it can be repeated several times. Um, so we can uh, I'll just talk a bit through it, but the part on the on, on the left here. So. Um, sorry, I think somebody there, uh, somebody needs to mute. I'm hearing some background stuff. Um, so somebody in the background needs to mute, please. Thank you. Yeah. So consider a brain tumor in any child presenting with the following, a headache. Now we'll talk a bit more about what sort of headaches you need to be particularly concerned about. Nausea and vomiting. Uh, anybody, child or adult, can have nausea or vomiting, but you know which ones do we need to be particularly concerned about? What visual symptoms and signs do we need to be concerned about? So, okay, reduced visual acuity and our visual fields, normal eye movements, abnormal fundus findings, particularly papilledema. Um, a lot of the other ones are a bit outside your area of expertise. Um, motor symptoms and signs, abnormal gait, so a kid who's not walking properly sort of falling over or stumbling, abnormal coordination and focal motor weakness. So weakness of an arm or leg, uh, weakness of one side of the face, that sort of thing. And then there are various growth and endocrine symptoms. Some tumors occur in around the pituitary and hypothalamus of the brain. It can affect uh, uh, hormones and can result in various things such as a failure of growth, both of height and weight, Delayed or arrested or puberty or puberty that comes on too early. Galactorrhea, which is milk production, which shouldn't be happening in kids. And primary or secondary amenorrhea, so in, uh, in girls who, who, can, who aren't, aren't menstruating, aren't having periods. Increasing head circumference uh, above and beyond what is normal for age. That's of, ref that's of relevance in smaller kids. Behavioral change, diabetes insipidus. Now, most people, when they think of diabetes, just use the word diabetes, and most diabetes is diabetes mellitus, which is relating to sugar control in the blood. But there's a, a less common form of diabetes called diabetes insipidus, where it's, they're also passing too much urine and losing fluid, but it's to do with uh, fluid balance. So it's a completely different condition to diabetes mellitus. Seizures that weren't there before are obviously concerning, and altered consciousness. And some of those ones are kind of obviously concerning, I'm sure would. Uh, you know, if if you came across them, you you would be very alarmed. Um, so assess children with any of these, uh, in particular, from your point of view, the visual system, uh, which we're going to talk about quite a bit, um, and for doctors in general, motor system, uh, height and weight, head circumference, and their their sort of endocrine or puberty status. And if a basic a basic rule is if a child has two or more symptoms relating to vision and the rest of the body, then they probably need a scan and neuroimaging. Right. So consider a brain tumor. Uh whoever you are, can you would you mind muting? Thank you. Thanks. Right. Consider a brain tumor in any child with a persistent headache. So Everybody has headaches. Kids have headaches. Adults have headaches. So it's important to sort of just drill down into that a little bit. 
Headaches on their own with nothing else are unlikely to be related to a brain tumor. Um, a lot of people develop headaches, especially in the second decade of life, especially migraine type headaches, more so in girls, especially if there's a family history, especially their mom. Um, and then kids at school develop headaches because they forget to drink water and so on. And they're in a lot, you know, a hot classroom for hours on end. So all, all these things can cause headache. But so headache alone is, 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 is not enough. Um, brain tumor headaches can occur at any time of the day. Uh, we all think of it, it was worse in the morning, but it can be at other times. Younger children may not be able to tell you they have a headache, so you have to sort of observe their behavior and you might have to sort of infer that they have a headache from how they're behaving. Um, so the kind of headaches you particularly need to be worried about is one that's, uh, that's persistent. It's there for days or weeks on end, and especially one that might wake a child from sleep. Uh, also be concerned about a headache that's, that's there on waking, persistent headache in a child under four, as they can tell you, obviously. Confusion or disorientation with a headache, uh, persistent headache with one or more symptoms. So symptoms could include ataxia or unsteadiness, uh, double vision, ringing in their ears, uh, nausea, vomiting. Um, Children can have headaches for other reasons, such as migraine or tension headaches. But if the pattern, the overall long-term pattern of the headache changes, you need to you need to bear that in mind. So you need to consider consider if there if a child has always sort of has been having migraines for several years, they've suddenly got worse, they've changed, something new has happened. You know, don't 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 you know all, all, always be aware that you know everybody has headaches anyway, you know, from time to time. But they could have a regular sort of headache problem and suddenly get a different problem, different headache pattern because they've got a brain tumor. Sometimes looking at the optic disc can be helpful, sometimes the disc bit misleading. So we talked a bit about headache. I'd like to talk about nausea and vomiting. So any child with persistent nausea and or vomiting needs to be considered as, as uh, possibly having a brain tumor. Persistent means probably more than a week. Um, because everybody gets bugs at this time of the year in particular, there's the norovirus, which you might have heard of, and it, which can keep a lot of kids out of school and sometimes hospitalized. So that can cause nausea, vomiting, and maybe diarrhea. Um, in younger kids, particularly under age two, the head circumference should be measured regularly at any health check and might be, should be uh, measured by either the GP or the health visitor. But if it's increasing above and beyond what's normal for age, that's a concern because it might be that there's raised pressure inside the head that's making the, the skull expand. So again, when it comes to nausea and vomiting, imaging might be required if there's persistent vomiting, especially on waking. Remember um, to exclude pregnancy. And it doesn't matter how much somebody denies they might be pregnant, basically, uh, you have to presume any child over about the age of 10, could uh, any girl over the age of 10 could potentially be pregnant. But like in any emergency department in the world, abdominal pain in a female of potentially childbearing age is pregnancy under the reason otherwise you must consider pregnancy as a possible. Um, it may not be your problem to consider, but I would certainly, you know, uh, you can pass it to the GPR, to the emergency room, but uh, don't forget pregnancy. The cause of vomiting. So, and also persistent nausea or vomiting with one or more symptom will also win you an, a, you know, an MRI scan. Um, visual problems. So we talked a bit about. Uh, sorry, go back one. Um, so, visual assessment in kids, you know, where you're concerned about their neurological status, you need to measure visual acuity, eye movements, pupils, optic disc appearance and maybe visual fields. But visual fields can be a bit of a, you know, it's full of pitfalls and it's very easy to get false positive visual, abnormal visual fields in kids. In other words, it's very easy to get one that um, seems abnormal, but it's very hard to interpret in kids. I'm not a great believer in visual fields as a method of diagnosing or screening for um, neurological problems in kids. Visual fields are helpful in somebody in, in a child that has a known tumor problem and you're monitoring it. But you have to do at least two or three visual fields before you get a reliable, repeatable field. 
certainly in adults and in kids, it might even take more than that. So um, when is imaging required? And uh, well, obviously, if a child has papilledema or you think they have papilledema, um, it's important to consider if they have optic atrophy, if they've new nystagmus. Most nystagmus in kids is present by about two to three months of age. And that's usually relating to something non-neurological. It's usually an ophthalmic problem, albinism. Uh, sometimes it can be uh, structural problems in the brain. Sometimes it can be drug exposure during pregnancy, other things. But you know, it should be there by about three months of age. And if it isn't, if it appears after that, then that's very worrying. Reduction in visual acuity, not due to refractive error. That's a tricky one because everybody, you know, I'm, you know, you, you as optometrists will know, you know, lots of kids have reduced vision due to refractive error. Which ones might have something else going on? Well, you know, let's take a typical kid who has farsightedness, especially if they have astigmatism, um, significant astigmatism. If you give glasses and they're worn well, it's at least 12 to 18 months before they reach their kind of optimal vision or the best vision they're going to get. So it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't improve fast. I mean, if you're not sure, of, we're, we're happy to sort of answer queries on kids with regard to vision and glasses. Uh, but, you know, it, it, vision can, it is, you know, we're talking months to years, not, not sort of uh, weeks. If you give glasses to a myope, their vision improves immediately. Someone with hyperopia and astigmatism, it takes a long while. Visual field defects warrant um, referral, but then that's very problematic in kids. I tend to do a sort of simple confrontation visual field testing in kids rather than automated fields, certainly in younger kids. Proptosis uh, goes without saying any proptosis is uh, warrants referral. New onset paralytic squint, third, fourth, sixth nerve palsy. Yeah, certainly needs to be assessed. And visual problems and one or more other other symptom such as persistent headache, nausea or vomiting, unsteadiness, all important. So HeadSmart, which is a UK wide charity, um, they've looked at presentation of uh, brain tumors in kids. So depending on which study you look at, visual symptoms or visual problems can be in the, the initial symptom between 7 to 41% of kids with brain tumors. And 70% of the kids will have some sort of visual problem at the time of diagnosis. Anything from 10% to a third will have papilledema. And somewhere between 6 and 20% can have abnormal eye movements at diagnosis. So it's very important to be able to assess a child's visual sys system if there's a, a reason to suspect that they might have a visual problem. Now, we can't assess every single child. Um, the hospital eye service is kind of increasingly overwhelmed. And when GPs are sort of in this situation, I, I think quite reasonably, they feel out of their depth in kids with report eye problems or their kind of headache or so on. I think most GPs these days um, will direct parents to bring their child to a local optom. I think that's a very reasonable thing to do. And what's very helpful is if you can sort of assess the child properly, measure vision, take a history. And if you're worried, send information on to us. If you can, um, including pictures of the optic nerves is absolutely invaluable. Other stuff like OCT, visual fields and so on, less so. Um, I think a good quality picture of the optic nerve is absolutely uh, you know, invaluable. Um, delayed diagnosis and brain tumors. Can, can be caused by a failure to fully assess visual function in a young or uncooperative child. And also if there's in, you know, ineffective communication between uh, optometrists in the community and primary or secondary care, so primary care being the GP, secondary care hospitals. Um, we've seen this slide before. I just, uh, and we talked, I talked a bit about visual acuity, eye movements, pupils, optic disc appearance and visual fields. I'm not going to go into those in details because you probably know something about them. You know, you should know, you should know a lot about them, but I want to try and put them in context. And I think a very good way of doing that is to present some cases. So the first one is a 16 year old female 
So this young lady presented to her local optician and she had headaches and reported problems with her vision. She also said that she had a pre-existing squint, but this has worsened. Her squint had become more noticeable. Um, father also reported that he felt that this girl's interning squint in her left eye had become more, more prominent over the previous few days. Um, it was a two month history of headaches, the front, frontal at the front of the head. And they were kind of, not all the time, but you know, for you know, large, large portions of the day. Um, curiously though, they were only occurring during the day, never on waking, and they did not wake her from sleep. She did however have one month of intermittent visual obscurations when she got up from sitting. So in other words, when she stood up, her vision went kind of dark. Um, so that's, that's quite a big red flag. Visual obscurations are something we very much worry about. It's this classical symptom that can occur in people with papilledema. And it probably occurs because when you've got papilledema, your optic nerve is swollen and it needs a greater degree, you know, you know greater force to push blood through the swollen optic nerve and into the eye. Um, and when you stand up, there's a slight drop in your blood pressure and it's a bit harder for the circulation to pump blood through the crowded optic nerve into the central retinal artery. That's probably why visual obscurations occur. This girl also reported intermittent tinnitus over the inner ears, but no double vision, no nausea, vomiting, dizziness, or ataxia, in other words, unsteadiness. So from the history alone, there was one or two things that were very concerning. This kid had had a persistent headache with one or more other symptoms. So persistent headache and increasing squint. Um, let's see, yeah, just going back to the previous slide, two months of headache. So that's, a, that's, you know, and she hadn't suffered from headaches previously. So persistent headache for two months, increasing squint, visual obscurations. There are, you know, one of those on their own, like, like the, even the headache alone, was is 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 was was quite uh, significant. Now, the squint here is a bit of a sort of confounding or confusing factor, because this young lady had been born with a, an interning squint, what we call infantile isotropia. She had uh, developed at a few months of age. She had squint surgery when she was eighteen months old. Later, as is uncommonly, uh, or, you know, unfortunately, common. She developed an outturning splint and had further surgery at about eight years of age. And things had been stable since then. So for the past eight years, she had a tiny kind of interning squint and all was stable. The left eye was also a little bit amblyopic uh, with 612 vision when she, when she was discharged from the hospital at 10 years of age. So on examination, 6-9 vision in the right eye, 6-12 in the left. To me, uh, a kid with a history of infantile isotropia, that's about normal vision. There's often when you look very, very, very hard at these kids, some very subtle nystagmus or latent nystagmus. In other words, when you cover one eye, you get a little bit of wobble in the other eye or one or both eyes. Sometimes it's only visible when you examine them on a slit ramp. But it's kind of typical for them not to have kind of 6-6 six, six or 6-5 six, vision. Pupils were normal, visual fields were normal on confrontation testing. The eye movements were full. So there was no sort of cranial nerve palsy. Um, in the left eye, there was a slight restriction of abduction eye turning. But given the history of the surgery she had, it, you know, it was consistent with the surgery. So the squint is a little sort of uncertain, but both child and father felt the squint had increased. She had a persistent headache and she had having vis visual obscurations. So optic nerve, important, very important. So we're lucky enough to have some opto optos or optimap pictures of this girl's left eye. This is the left eye, obviously. So I think you know, there's no prizes for kind of identifying that that is an abnormal optic nerve. It's very swollen. You just, you just cannot see any of the disc margins anywhere. Um, the blood vessels on the surface of the optic nerve are obscured. There's some splinter hemorrhages. 
you know, uh, that's a swollen optic nerve. That's a right eye, similar, very swollen optic nerve, blood vessels obscured on the surface of the optic nerve, a lot of uh, flame shaped hemorrhages. And also an incidental finding of a sort of pigmented lesion in the peripheral retina, probably a lesion called a chirpy, which is a congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium. Could also be a toxoplasmosis scar, but it's it's not relevant to what we're seeing in the optic nerve. It's, sort of, it's, it's an incidental finding. Um, so given the history of visual obscurations, swollen optic nerves are not unexpected. So to, to summarize, persistent headaches, not exactly a new onset squint, but possibly a change in a pre-existing squint in swollen optic discs. So urgent scan. Now this is an MRI scan. Um, the, the, the one on the left is what's called T2 weighted MRI scan. You can tell that because the, the CSF in the, um, the cerebral ventricles is white. And to me, I'm not an ex, I'm not a radiologist, but the ventricles look a bit dilated. They look a bit bigger than normal. Um, in a different scan picture, it's, it's hard to see here, but there's a small tumor in an area called the thalamus, which is on the base of the brain. Thalamus is important in uh, movement and other things. And uh, sort of sits between what's called the third and fourth ventricles of the brain. So it's one of the areas where fluid circulates. So it, was, it wasn't very big, but it was enough to block the circulation of cerebral spinal fluid around the brain. So this girl required an urgent, it's called ETV or endoscopic third ventriculostomy. So in order to relieve the high pressure, the neurosurgeons, that is a very tiny sort of endoscopic approach, were able to sort of make an opening to let the fluid circulate normally and relieve the pressure. Um, this particular kid was referred by her optician to the emergency department, who referred her to ophthalmology, who identified the papilledema and referred her back to the emergency department for a scan. So the emergency department are, well, yeah, I, I think ideally she should have been referred to ophthalmology first. In, in, invariably what happens in an emergency department, well, firstly, there's the obvious long queue. Um, which could be six to 12 hours. Um, they might take a history. They, they probably won't have access to the fundus pictures the optometrist sends in via Sky Gateway. They may not, well, they may not know they're there, um, but ophthalmologists know how to find them uh, because they're in our um, triage system. We can have a look at those, assess the kid and say, oh, this really is papilledema. This, this is urgent and take it from there. And we would liaise either with the emergency department or possibly with pediatric neurology because they're often a better option. One of the problems about referring a child with neurological symptoms to an emergency department is that they pitch up in the evening or weekend and they get a CT scan, which may or may not show any abnormality. And even it, it, the problem is if it's normal, nobody's happy because they say, well, actually need an MRI scan. So they end up getting an MRI scan um, so they've had at least one unnecessary scan and the CT scan, nobody's happy with it for outruling brain tumors or abnormalities and it has a considerable radiation exposure, but it's all that's available out of ours. It's perfect for somebody who's had a head injury and you're, you want to outrule a, you know, a brain hemorrhage or some acute pathology, but often it's done as a knee jerk response out of ours because everybody's panicking. So better there's, they, if they see someone out of ours or an emergency, best to see an ophthalmologist and we can kind of basically bypass the emergency room and talk straight to the pediatric neurologist. And it's just, it's just a much better path for the child and family and everyone. So referrals from primary to secondary care. If you think there's a very high risk of tumor, you're really urgent, you're, you're quite, you know, you're 95, 90, 95% certain, 100% certain there's something very bad here, same day referral. If it's headaches, swollen nerves, and the child is otherwise medically well, then I think refer to ophthalmology. Only if the child is sort of medically unwell, there's a lot of vomiting and a lot of sort of unsteadiness and the child's maybe semi-conscious, they need to go straight to the emergency department. 
if they're kind of otherwise medically well, I think ophthalmology first. If they're lower risk, then refer through Sky Gateway. If you're concerned, you could always sort of phone and try and talk to the triage line. But um, certainly as far as kids are concerned, Sky Gateway is checked several times a day. We're onto it very quickly. and We're always looking for things like this or anything that's of concern. Um, delayed diagnosis, well, you know, it's probably not due to optoms not referring quickly. In fact, it, you know, as we all guess, it's probably the opposite. Optoms refer lots. Um, I think failure of communication between primary and secondary care is one for concern. That, in other words, the GPs may not quite appreciate what they're looking at. A lot of um, undergraduate medical students may, may get little or no ophthalmology during, during their undergraduate years. And increasingly, uh, graduated doctors and often very senior doctors are not happy, are not sort of confident at doing basic ophthalmic examinations, just looking at the optic nerve with an ophthalmoscope. Um, so we, we are very heavily kind of reliant on and value the input from primary care op op optometrists, or high street optometrists. And then we, we sort of ask GPs, you know, if, if they haven't already done so to direct a lot of work to you, because, you know, that's, that's our best sort of means of communication. So the girl I just showed the pictures um, of, yes? Sorry. Can I just interrupt? We've got a question from Jason asking, yep. how significant is Horner's in a four month old? Okay, very good. Um, a Horner syndrome in a four month old is probably congenital unless it's changing. The Horner syndrome, for those who don't know, or you probably do know, is a lesion of the sympathetic nerve supply to the eye. And it's, um, the affected eye has a slightly smaller pupil and a slightly lower eyelid. So it's only a slight degree of ptosis or eyelid droop, maybe a couple of millimeters. Um, it's generally uncommon. Um, if it's congenital, often the iris color is a bit different. It's often a bit lighter than the other side. If it's kind of noted in a newborn and it's not particularly changing, I mean, we would definitely see it with the kid within a week or so, a week or two. And we might discuss it with a neurologist who might investigate on our behalf. Um, but I certainly wouldn't send them to the emergency room. If it's acquired, if it definitely wasn't there in the first few months of life and it appears, then that is urgent. But again, unless the child's medically kind of unwell, I think first stop ophthalmology rather than the emergency department. Because occasionally, as, as you may know, a Horner syndrome can be caused by a tumor called a neuroblastoma in the abdomen or spreads from the abdomen up through the chest and it affects the sympathetic nerve chain in the chest. But um, it's, it's, it's often overdiagnosed, but it does occur. Hopefully that answers your question. We've got another one. Um, can postural hypertension cause visual obscurations? Uh, yes. But um, yes, it can, but you not commonly. But often it goes along with being generally a bit faint. So it's not just a visual problem, but it's sort of everything goes a bit faint on standing. Um, so if you're not sure, you could ask the GP to see them and check their blood pressure. And you could have a look at their optic nerves. If the optic nerves look healthy, then it's postural hypertension. If you're going to have visual obscurations, there should be pretty no pretty kind of obvious papilledema. Great, thank you. Um, so carrying on, just finishing off case number one. So this girl's symptoms improved following what's called endoscopic third ventriculostomy, basically bypassing the the the, the blockage. She had no headaches, no visual symptoms, and after all her successful treatment of a brain tumor. Um, she still has a small esotropia. The second one is an 11 year old male presented to the GP with a four week history of headaches, sometimes associated with vomiting, and more concerning, and even more concerningly, one week history of horizontal binocular double vision. So, an 11 year old should be able to tell you that they have headache, 
that they feel sick, that they're getting sick, and that they have double vision. Um, the younger child may well not. So referred by the optometrist due to their optic disc appearance after review with the GP. Um, so again, looking at the sort of things we're concerned about, uh, you know, the kind of things that might indicate that a child has a brain tumor. So a new persistent headache, um, and it's not just a headache in isolation. Um, it's associated with other symptoms such as double vision. Uh, so obviously very concerning. Remember, I mentioned before, a child might have a pre-existing headache condition, such as migraine or tension headaches. So even if they have a pre-existing headache condition, if there's a change in the nature of the headache, then that requires to be, you know, you need to take that very seriously and it probably needs to be assessed or does need to be assessed. So, you know, if it's bad enough, the headache that the child or, or adolescent or adult presents because of it, obviously you need to take it seriously. So just because they have a history of migraine doesn't mean you can put a headache down to migraine. Um, this slide, I think you all know, know about it. It was uh, Freddie Burgess pre prepared this talk for uh, pediatricians in the uh, Children's Hospital here in Edinburgh. So it's um, as you know, optometrists have a, 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 an expanded scope of practice and a lot of responsibility since 2006. And we like to we want to emphasize to GPs and pediatricians that you know it is a perfectly reasonable and very legitimate option to refer kids with certain visual problems to primary care optometry in the first place. Um, so uh, it's something we, we value greatly. So anyway, this kid with uh, headache, vomiting, and double vision. Uh, when he was assessed by the optometrist, had full fields, 6'6 six, six vision, both eyes, normal pupils. Left eye had some restricted abduction, however, and he had some upbeating nystagmus. So vertical nystagmus that wasn't there before is, is always concerning. Um, always thinking of structural things in the brain, especially in the fo posterior fossa of the brain, possibly brain stem, but especially posterior fossa. So some optic nerve pictures again. Um, you can see it, it, uh, both optic nerves look abnormal, but it's, it's not symmetric. The right optic nerve is markedly swollen. Um, you can see the, the, the pattern of the blood vessels. Can you see my pointer there? Hopefully you can. As they, as they get towards the optic nerve, they have to lift up because the nerve is swollen and elevated. There's a big, there's some splinter hemorrhages. The, in the left eye, um, it's, it is obviously swollen, but it's not as swollen as the right eye. Um, so, you know, you'd ex you, you would expect both optic nerves to be equally swollen, but it's often not. And it's used to, just due to quirks of individual anatomy, why that should be so. Um, this kid, another MRI scan. This is a big tumor in his posterior fossa. So if you compare it to the size of the eyeball, it's about double the size of the eyeball. So this is something kind of tennis ball size. So tumor can, you know, be there quite a while and be relatively silent until it's quite large, depending on which, which part of the brain it's in. So on this, what's called a sagittal scan of the eye, tumor is here it's at the base of the brain if you hopefully you can see my pointer there it's in the posterior fossa the back part of the brain um after treatment his optic nerve settled i, I don't have color pictures but i do have some octs of his optic nerves because we, we use oct for monitoring papilledema it's very effective for that incidentally and I, I, I think in the previous talk i talked a bit about papilledema and optic nerves um, we, in a suspicious optic nerve, we will tend to do an OCT, but we don't rely on us to make a diagnosis of papilledema. We go by history and clinical examination primarily. OCT can be helpful in diagnosis, but where it's really where it, where it really comes into its own is monitoring established papilledema to see if it's worse, better, or the same. 
So this kid was treated with chemotherapy and surgery and proton beam radiotherapy and did very, again, did very well uh, with no recurrence long-term. The so final- well, Sorry, again, there's another question. Um, sure. will, there, will there always be papilledema in those with raised CSF pressure? Not necessarily. Usually, yes, but, but not absolutely uh, uh, the case. So history is always important. Also clinical examination. Uh, because I see a lot of kids and adults with squints, I'm always looking for things like sixth and seventh nerve palsies. So sixth nerve palsy, an interning squint that's bigger in the distance than near and bigger on side gaze. Also very important. So in someone with headache, that would sort of uh, be, you know, that would uh, be, be a worrisome feature. Papilledema takes days or even a few weeks to develop. So if there's raised pressure in the CSF is, is relatively recent, discs might not be swollen. A very common scenario is kids who've had a brain injury. So either accidental or non-accidental injury where there's very high pressure in the brain. Um, we often are asked to examine them in the ICU, you know, a day or two in, or sometimes on the day they come in and the, the optic nerve wouldn't be swollen because the pressure hasn't been raised long enough. In the vast majority of people, if, in, if, the, if you've high pressure in the CSF, the nerves will be swollen, but it takes time. Any other questions right now, Louise? Okay. Um, case number three is a three-year-old female. Okay, three-year-old, a bit more challenging because they may well not be able to tell you what's going on. You know, the only indication that there's something wrong might be that they're just unhappy. They're, they might be able to tell you they have a sore head or they might be just a bit funky and not sleepy and not eating. Now, a lot of three-year-olds can be like that anyway. So you do have to sort of, you know, it's important to talk carefully to the parents. If the parents are quite sure that there's a change in the child's behavior, it's always important to take that seriously. Um, always listen to the parents. Um, and observe the child if they're well enough. I mean, if the child is unwell, then medically unwell, or sort of semi-conscious or very sleepy, et cetera, um, then they, they need to see either a GP or a pediatrician in the emergency room. Anyway, three-year-old female, she presented to the emergency department via the GP with vomiting, vomiting and waking for about four weeks and had unequal pupils. So going back to the question, Somebody asked a little while ago about Horner syndrome, where you have unequal sized pupils. So this kid had unequal pupils. Um, so this child had persistent vomiting, nausea, um, and it had been going on for about a month. Uh, obviously, far too young to be of childbearing age. Um, so an MRI scan was carried out. Now, interestingly, this kid had been seen in their local eye department about six months previously due to the anisocoria. Um, they were found to have a refractive error given glasses. There was no squint present and the optic nerves were healthy. Um, prior to presentation, the kid had been not their usual self. They were taking their glasses off more than usual. Any three-year-old with glasses might take them off, but she had been wearing them pretty well but was taking them off. Um, she didn't object to occlusion of either eye. The right pupil was indeed a bit larger than the left, but both were briskly reactive to light and didn't look like a Horner's or a third nerve palsy. The visual fields were full on confrontation testing, uh, which in a three-year-old is about all you're going to be able to do. They're bringing in a target or even fingers from the peripheral vision until the child sees it and their eyes turn to look at it. The very subtle interning squint esotropia with some restriction of abduction it looked like a six nerve palsy. But in an unwell three year old, it can be difficult to, to be sure about these things sometimes. Um, what was noticeable with this kid is that most times, a three year old who's unwell um, is not going to be terribly happy with you examining them. They're going to be fighting you off. You might be. You know, certainly if you're a, an ophthalmologist seeing them on a ward, the children's hospital or in the emergency department, 
you'll have been the third or fourth person at least to have examined them that day or that night and they're pretty pissed off by the time you see them. This kid was unusually compliant. Basically, they just didn't object to him being examined. Well, that sounds good. It's actually not a good sign because kids, three-year-olds should be fighting off. I mean, that's, that's their thing. So this kid really didn't kind of uh, object to the, the ophthalmology trainee who was going to look in the back of their eyes. They were found to have bilateral swollen optic nerve heads. Because it's a three-year-old child, we weren't able to get photographs. But, um, you know, uh, unwell child, vomiting, new onset squint, swollen optic nerves, uh, you know, urgent CNS imaging. And like the previous child, had a posterior fossa mass, uh, you know, tumor in the posterior fossa of the brain. So once again, to reiterate, headaches are important. The pattern of the headaches is extremely important. Uh, the presence of vomiting, a few days of vomiting in itself isn't that significant, but going on for a, you know, more than a week is, and vision, any sort of vision issue. You put them all in context though, because any on their own are common. Lots of kids have headaches. Lots of kids have slightly funny looking optic discs, but only a small minority, minority of them will have a brain tumor. Um, Louise, can we rerun the um, the quiz, if that's okay, the, the questions? Just let me reset but, them. Yeah, if you don't mind. So, right. Okay, that should be it ready now. So, I'm just going to talk, I'm going to ask you to sort of reconsider your answers for all of these. So, firstly, question one. What headache feature is most suggestive of raised intracranial pressure? Which one would be most concerning? Any of them can be concerning, and they don't all follow a particular pattern. So morning headache for a week, headache relieved by sleep, pre-existing headaches that have been worse for the past uh, month, or headaches while at school. So I, th I think quite reasonably, two of these options have been kind of immediately discounted by everyone. Headache relieved by sleep is generally sort of, that's a reassuring thing. That's kind of kind of pattern you get. Migraine, headaches while at school. Well, didn't we all? We all got headaches while we're at school because we didn't want to be there. Or, well, depending what it was. Um, so morning headache for a week and pre-existing headaches that have been worse for the past month. Headache for a week is probably, a week is probably not long enough for a headache to be really concerning. I mean, it might be due to raising cranial pressure, but... You know, I think one that's several weeks or a month or more is, is would be kind of, that would be more concerning, regardless of the time of day, and especially if there's a pre-existing headache pattern that's changed. So I a week, you know, could be just, you know, they might have had COVID, they might be a bit unwell. Um, it, it could be, it could be due to something bad. But the option three, the pre-existing headaches that have been worse for the past month, that, that, that's more concerning, I would think. Uh, Louise, can we have question number two, please? Two seconds. So. There you go. So which of the following is most concerning? Crowded optic discs and a myope, increased blurring of the nasal disc margin over several years, crowded optic disc and a hyperope, absence spontaneous from venous pulsation. Um, so crowded optic disc and a hyperope, yeah, you know, that's, they all, or many of them will have slightly crowded appearance. Increased blurring of the nasal disc margin. Uh, I mean, that's really common, especially in adults. Um, a lot of myopes have slightly tilted optic nerves and it's not uncommon for the tilting to be doing, increased slightly over the years and for the nasal margin to become a bit more blurred. And, and we get quite a lot of these referrals. And unless there's some other feature, um, I would just sort of politely uh, refuse them. And But I will always write back to the referring optom, copy to the GP and a copy to the patient or the parents explaining why. Um, but you know, we're happy to take these uh, queries, but you know, a, a lot of them we will knock back as 
you know, and I suspect that a lot of the time people are just looking for reassurance, but we're happy to, you know, to, to consider those. Um, absent venous pulsation on the disc. Well, venous pulsation can, can be uh, missing in, in, in normal people. It's not always present. If it's present, it's very reassuring, but its absence doesn't really kind of get you any further. Um, so a crowded optic disc and a myope, yeah, that's a kind of a bit more concerning. I mean, none of these are, you know, really uh, super worrying. I mean, you can have a kind of slightly cut optic disc and a hypro, you can have a slightly crowded disc and a myo, uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the wrong way around. I agree. So I think that I would agree that crowded optic disc and a myo is the most concerning one there. And Louise, can we have the last question? Thank you. And we've just had Patricia asking, can you just clarify, should children's referrals still go to PEEP rather than to the sick kids? Yeah, well, unless it's super urgent and, you know, if the child is medically unwell, then they should go to be sent to the emergency department in the children's hospital. Otherwise, it just goes, it's basically, it's into the general ophthalmology triage pile. And the person in the waiting list office who kind of assesses us will sort of take note of the fact that if they're six, under 16 years of age, they're marked as a child. And between the pediatric ophthalmologists, we triage these regularly. They're looked at every day. So while some of the adult ones sometimes wait a while to be triaged, the kids are, we patrol it very, very, very carefully. So just to uh, uh, NHS Lothian ophthalmology. And another one is, does presence of SVP categorically rule out papilledema? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Um, I mean, maybe you've see, come across an exception, but I've never seen spontaneous venous pulsation present in somebody with papilledema. So question three, which of the following is most concerning? When I say most concerning, makes you most worried about brain tumor or something horrible. So a gradually increasing squint over six months, sudden onset squint, large but stable squint, or increasing esotropia over one month. So the sudden onset squint is, a, is an interesting one. In my experience, it's almost never associated with, with a nasty. It's almost never associated with brain tumor or something horrible. In the last 20 years in Edinburgh, only, and I've seen lots of these, you know, it's probably comfortably over a hundred. I can only think of one kid who had a sudden onset squint that had a brain tumor. And this child had on examination, a very obvious six nerve palsy and um, ataxia. She was unsteady on her feet. She was sort of, you know, falling around a bit. And the poor child uh, was called a brainstem glioma and ultimately died. Of all the rest, none, absolutely none, had brain tumor. Um, some of them end up in the emergency department and get an emergency CT scan, uh, which is normal. Then if they're, ideally, uh, they would next be sent to the ophthalmology service, but sometimes they go to the neurology service and then they get an MRI scan. And if they're really unlucky, they might get a lumbar puncture or somebody sticks a needle into their spinal space to measure the pressure. Um, but this acute onset squint is usually younger kids who are hypermetropic and the, you know, they've, got, they've been sort of teetering on the edge of having a squint. And then the brain just kind of gives up and they can't hold the eye straight anymore. The eyes just suddenly turn. So in that situation, typically what you find is that the eye movements are pretty normal. You do a cyclorefraction and you find that they're significantly hypermetropic and the optic discs look normal. So if they came to an ophthalmologist first, uh, which is a minority of the time, I do the usual examination, give them glasses. Depending on the situation, if the parents are really anxious and freaking out, um, I'll get the neurologists involved and they, they may often do a scan, but if they're going to have a scan, it's better that they have an MRI scan first and not an emergency CT scan on a Friday night. Um, the, of the four con scenarios there, the one that would concern me most actually is the number four, 
increasing esotropia over one month because brain tumors tend to get worse fairly quickly. Um, option number one, increasing over six months. Well, kind of some squints increase. Six months is too long to be really considering a brain tumor unless there's other findings as well. One month is kind of, you know, when, when kids present with brain tumor, you, the, the history inevit inevitably or invariably is symptoms have been sort of several weeks to a kind of four to six weeks of sort of changes, usually not much more than that. It's that's, that's the sort of time frame you're thinking of. But sudden onset squint, everybody freaks out, the parents freak out, the grandparents freak out, everybody's sure the child has a brain tumor. Of all the things that kind of come in as emergencies, our urgent referrals, they're the one that concern me the least uh, because it's almost never something bad. That's an easy win for us. Because, you know, we're not telling somebody that their child has a brain tumor or something. So they are, are obviously important. Um, the, you know, there's a huge degree of parental anxiety. Of course there is. Parents are anxious. All parents are anxious. It's their job. But the best thing you can do in that situation is to reassure, reassure the parents that this is very unlikely to be a brain tumor, but you are going to refer them urgently. Uh, but I would, I would implore you to, to try and refer to ophthalmology rather than to an emergency department at all possible. Okay, um, right, questions. You can either unmute yourself and ask, or you can type them out and I can ask on your behalf, whichever you prefer. And just a reminder that we have recorded tonight's event so it will be available on um, the portal over the next few days if anybody wants to re-watch it or just go back through to clarify anything okay oh very quiet oh here we go can you please explain again why sudden onset onset sorry is unlikely to be a brain tumor sorry i'll read it again because i'm yeah Okay. Well, can you please I, explain again why sudden onset is unlikely to be brain tumor? Well, I I can sort of all I can say is that in twenty years as a consultant, I've seen lots and lots of sudden onset squints, and they're virtually never due to brain tumor. I, as a, a, as I mentioned before, I've only seen one that turned out to be a brain tumor, um, and that kid obviously had a a sixth nerve palsy rather than the usual type of childhood squint where the eyes move normally. And they had an other, had other neurological findings. You know, and that was in the emergency room you know, at night. So it was sort of, there's always something else. As to why, uh, well, brain tumors tend to evolve you know, over sort of weeks. And the findings are kind of, so it's not sort of sudden. Um, it's sort of, it grows over sort of, you know, several weeks. The things that happen suddenly are strokes in older older people, or trauma, um, or in, in young kids. It's just there's been a kind of they they've the typical situation is a child who's hypermetropic and has a sort of you know, you know they've been the brain has been managing to overcome the hypermetropia and keep the eyes straight. And suddenly it just reaches a point where it just can't do it anymore. And they suddenly develop a squint. Um, so I can only presume that it's just been, they've been sort of hanging on by their fingernails for, a, for several weeks. And suddenly they develop a squint. It, it sometimes happens when they have an immunization or they fall and bump their head, fall down the stairs, they kind of fall off the sofa, et cetera. So everybody's blaming the fact that they had an immunization or they had a bump on their head, but um, you know, if you see a child like that, they're otherwise well, and they've got five doctors of hypermetropia, I'm trying to persuade them that you know, this squint was just waiting to happen. It wasn't the immunization, it wasn't the bump on the head. No, this was coming. It just happened to have happened. You know, it just happened to have done it today. Okay, any tips for examination of very young children? Um, 
right? I think when, when they come in to the examination room, it's good, you know, don't lunge straight in. It's good to start with sort of niceties with parents and trying to make sort of social contact with the child, depending on the small, you know, the age and how anxious or otherwise the child is. Once they've settled, if, you know, as long as the child is kind of relatively happy, I tend to move into the examination bit pretty quickly um, because um, the longer the child is in the room, the, you know, the, the, the concentration tends to go more and more and they may become a bit more fed up and then they just want to sort of leave or they want to be fed or they want to sort of, you know, play with all the, ins the inter interesting instruments you have in your room. Um, if the child is very distressed, it's going to be very difficult. You can only do your best. If it's a sort of semi-urgent type referral you, you, or situation, you, I think you, what you need to do is you need to try and identify what are the key features you want to try and look at. You know, will I be able to measure vision? Can I assess if there's a squint um, and eye movements? You know, if it's a very upset child, just give them time to try and settle down. You know, maybe sit back a bit. I often just sort of sit back and let them kind of scream for a while. Might use a direct ophthalmoscope and just hold the sort of maybe dim the room lights and just as they calm down, just kind of bring the direct ophthalmoscope up and just see, look at their corneal reflections. Are the eyes straight? Move the ophthalmoscope around. Can their eyes move normally? You know, can they abduct the eyes? Can their eyes move up and down? Do they have a, a fundus reflex? And take it from there. Um, you kind of learn by trial and error, but um, as I say, don't lunge straight in. Have a, you know, get let the child settle in. But once they're settled, I, I would move on to the examination fairly quickly. And sometimes you have to explain to the parents, you know, let's do the examination bit now while the child's still happy. We can talk some more later. Hopefully, mm -hmm. that was helpful. Can you differentiate a crowded versus a swollen disc on OCT? You can, but not always. Um, I think a clinical examination of, of the nerve is, is better. Um, the thing is, when it's obvious, it's obvious. So when it's obvious on clinical examination, it's obvious on OCT, but sometimes, sometimes OCT can be confusing. Um, and certainly I would, if I had to choose one thing to, to diagnose papilledema or a swollen disc, it would be clinical examination on the slit lamp with a lens, like a, with a Vogue lens of some sort, such as the 78 or a super field lens, where you can actually have a good close-up look at the disc in 3D. Jules has just said, I find my 20D Vogue pretty awesome for kids. Do you use it in hospital settings much? Yes, I use different lenses for different settings. And I think uh, I think that's a very good point, Jules. Um, try and use the same lens each time because it's much easier to compare from, uh, you know, compare from child to child. So in general, in the clinic, looking at optic discs in kids, um, I use a 20 doctor lens because it gives a slightly more magnified view. If I'm looking in the peripheral retina, say in the neonatal unit, and we're looking at the prem babies, I tend to use a 28 because you, you get out more into the peripheral retina, but it's not so good for the optic disc. But you know, for the optic disc in a sort of standard clinical setting, 20, 20D lens is my, is my go-to. Oh, if the child is old enough, um, try and stay in practice with the direct ophthalmoscope. I use it a lot. And sometimes in kids where they're just, coming for a review of their squint or whatever. And in an awful lot of kids, I'll just sort of get the direct ophthalmoscope and have a quick look through undilated pupils at the optic discs. It's, it's good to keep in practice. And it is a good instrument. It gives a really magnified view. Um, is there RAPD present with papilledema? Uh, usually not. Okay. Short and sweet. Yep. And Alexandra is saying slightly off topic, any tips for seeing kids with concussion? How long would you expect them to be symptomatic for and when would you be worried? Hmm. Um, concussion's a funny one. Um, 
and it's a it has all sorts of manifestations it's, and the best way to think of concussion is as sort of like well the head's been shaken about it's like a computer that's been sort of dropped on the ground and it's not functioning quite well enough um if a child has a really acute and worrisome problem as a result of head injury, they'll be unwell pretty quickly within about 12 to 20, well, within the first 12 hours, um, you know, if they've got a, a brain bleed. Um, double vision problems like fourth nerve palsy often aren't symptomatic for several days in kids and adults uh, for reasons I'm not quite sure why. Um, perhaps because there's swelling of tissues and things over the few days after the injury. But if somebody has a, say a head injury that, you know, they're not unconscious and results in a fourth nerve palsy, they'll often say to you that the double vision didn't appear till sort of day two or three or four. Um, all the other stuff is often much vaguer. And the problem is, you know, if it's occurring after 24 hours, it isn't, it's most unlikely to be due to something nasty inside, like a, like a bleed on the brain. It's just general concussion. The problem is, where do you send them if they're having symptoms? For the most part, there's no particular treatment or, um, or even investigation. But um, it, it, it's a, you know, as I say, a tricky one. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody have any further questions? Oh, here we go. Uh I have one question. I hear no mention of oculokinetic response. Is that um, valid anymore? We always used, we were always taught to gently take the child up and gently rotate them in one direction and then in the opposing direction and look for any loss of the railway type nystagmus. Um, it, it I tend to use that in small kids when I'm looking for sort of uh, very small babies who are referred with um, possible failure of development of vision. Um, and also look at the optokinetic response in the, well, for certain eye movement problems, uh, say, um, use it in specific situations. Um, if there's a, I mean, I, I tend to look, do, look at the saccadic eye movements and maybe use OKN as well. Um, occasionally you'll see a problem with, with a, optokinetic response in people with a dorsal midbrain syndrome, which is pretty rare. But I have once diagnosed a dorsal midbrain syndrome, which was due to a pineal tumor, just because of a optokinetic response where on, on, on sort of attempted upward decays, the, the eyes did a funny eye movement. But for the most part, it's not something we do regularly. Okay, thank you. And another question. If a patient who has been referred by their GP for examination due to recent onset persistent headaches and vomiting, and they are found to have no ocular findings, should we refer them back to their GP or on to secondary care? I think the GP, um, because, yeah, I, and I'm, I'm a big believer in keeping the GP in the loop on all things. So, so uh, because it's the child's medical home, and they may know stuff about the child that they, that you don't, or that they felt they couldn't put in the referral. So yeah, I think the GP, and unless the child is acutely unwell, you know, like a, like semi-conscious, having seizures, or you no, know, it's a, it's a real emergency. Great, thank you. Okay, last chance saloon for any last questions to Dr. Malvi Hill. No, nobody's doesn't appear to be anything further, Alan. Um, for everybody that's attended tonight, you'll get your feedback form as normal tomorrow or the next day. So if you want to complete that and send it back to us, we'll get your certificate sent out to you as normal as well. Okay, so just want to say thank you to Dr. Mulvihill. Um, thank you, Louise. And um, very best of luck in your move. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks everybody. And thanks for uh, persisting with it. Hope, hopefully you found it helpful. I've tried to make it sort of practical and chatty rather than sort of didactic talk with, you know, 20 different conditions, uh, just to try and give you a feel for kind of how things present in real life. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much, everybody. And we'll hopefully see you all again soon. Take care. Good night. Here we go. Bye. Bye-bye.